Just hold on. <laughs> it's like when after all that, UV, if it, it doesn't took work. A lot, it took a while, so. Well, we are back in regular session. Please stand, remove cover, and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Included in the packet is some informational reports from some other committee meetings, some unapproved and some approved there. Item D is third quarter financials. So, Faye, I'll turn it over to you guys over there, to Daniel and Faye. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item was included in the packet, and there's also hard copies on the table um, on the side if anyone is interested. Uh, going over these, uh, the cash balances as of the end of September 21, uh, you can see almost all the cash balance uh, that we have is in our checking account. Um, if you would compare this to several years back, uh, we used to try to keep an awful lot in uh, CDs, but frankly, uh, the payment for or the interest rate on CDs is actually lower now than what we're getting in our checking account. So uh, that's why we're not doing that anymore. When you look at interest received, uh, you can see that the vast majority of our interest um, has been from uh, TIFFs, where we've made almost 38000 uh, That interest payment is going to be higher the next time we show you this, and that's because the TIF interest we receive twice a year. And there's also, I believe, two or three uh, new TIFFs that are going to be paying interest this quarter. And so that will be higher um, for the year end. But Still, when you look at it so far, it's been, I believe, almost $50,000 uh, for TIF or for total interest. And if you would compare that to 10 years ago, I think it was about 3000 or so that we would get in interest. And so that's been a significant improvement. When you look at the uh, general fund revenues uh, through the end of September, uh, property tax, uh, we have received 10% more. That doesn't mean our property taxes have actually gone up by 10%. It's just people have paid earlier than what they have in the past. Uh, sales tax, though, is up 21%. Um, and uh, it's been a phenomenal year of sales tax as we continue to report. Uh, so that's been great. Uh, licenses and permits, uh, that includes everything from building permits as well as our um, temporary vendor permits. That has been up 7%. Uh, general government up 19%. Um, and what was the main driver of that, Faye? Do you remember? General government. General government. It's the yeah, a lot of additional rally income that came from there. Um, culture and recreation is up 37%. Um, that really has been driven by the community center. Uh, the community center has been far more active this year. Um, and uh, again, that's really, we've seen a significant increase over the past uh, three and a half years of the community center. Last year was a noticeable dip, and that's because of COVID-19, of course. Uh, we were closed for, I think, about a month and a half or so. Um, but ever since it's been reopened, there's been a steady increase as well. Uh, when you see a 92% uh, increase um, airport, that really is uh, from the fuel sales. Um, the revenue has increased dramatically at our fuel uh, station at the airport. The airport is busier and busier all the time, and they continue to buy additional fuel. Um, and other than that, it's uh, pretty much typical uh, so the total revenue so far this year has been up 13%, and that's for the first three quarters of the year. Uh, looking at our expenses, uh, through the end of the uh, third quarter, mayor and council, uh, there was a reduction of 42%. Um, that's because in 2020, the Samson lease agreement um, was paid out of mayor and council. And so um, with that no longer occurring out of your budget, uh, there's been a 42% reduction. Um, attorney, a 45% increase. But again, just to put that in perspective, um, there was some retirement uh, payouts that came from that, but also largely tr the trademark development. And that was part of our rally financials. But even when it's in the rally financials, that can be separated in several different departments. This is one example that some of the outside legal expenses were paid out of our um, attorney department. 
Um, looking at the city manager department, it's an increase of 103%. Um, that, however, is because $242,000, that was for a new ambulance as well as a remount of an ambulance that was paid for um, out of the city manager department. And so um, that's an expense out of the general fund that was transferred to the ambulance fund. The reason why it originally began in the general fund was that was some of our COVID funds that we received in 2020. Uh, we received about 1.8 million. Out of that 1.8 million, 242,000 was spent on ambulance. But all of those funds were deposited in the general fund, and then we had to transfer money out into other departments if they were going to make use of it. Um, in planning and permitting, we did um, purchase some new survey equipment. Um, in sponsorship, you do see a large increase, 130%. Uh, that is the settlement to cancel the uh, license agreement with SMRI that was done earlier this year. Uh, the rally department, a 91% increase, but really that's because in 2020 we had very few rally activities. Pretty much everything was canceled um, during last year's rally, and so we didn't have the expenses from that. Um, this year was a more typical rally, so we had all the expenses. Um, in the fire, uh, there is a 41% increase. That is because of new radios. Um, we did receive a grant that paid for, I believe, all of that or almost all of that. Um, so there was revenue that matched that, but still it, the expense was an increase for that. Uh, the airport, a 32% increase in the expense. But again, why there's a 32% increase is because our fuel sales are increasing. So we're making money selling it, but we also have to expend the money purchasing the actual fuel. But uh, we are making a significant profit from that. The community center um, shows a 19% increase, but that's because uh, there's a custodial uh, component in there. Before, the custodial services uh, were a contract service that was separated into several different departments. In this year's budget, in 2021, it's all included um, within the community center budget in 2022, though, we actually have a separate department um, that is a custodial services. <clears throat> Looking at our um, end of third quarter cash, CD, and loan advances um, for the end of the quarter, if you look at the general fund, uh, you can see that we ended the year at about $3.6 million in our general fund. Uh, the recommended reserve balance is about $1.6 million, uh, so we are very, very healthy. Um, and you can see that uh, the city has continually increased our reserve balance. You can see in uh, 2011, we were essentially half of what the uh, recommended reserve was. Now we well exceed the recommended reserve. Um, and again, this is for the end of September. This is actually one of our lower quarters. Uh, by cash wise. So at the end of December, uh, we should probably be a little higher than that. And the liquor fund, you'll see that we're positive. Um, that again, um, the liquor store uh, ended up going negative in the cash balance when we uh, built the store and we had to uh, increase our, um, our inventory in the liquor store. And it took quite some time to dig out of there. Um, there have been several changes at the liquor store, and our sales have increased dramatically, as have the profitability. So now we're transferring well over $300,000 from the liquor store to the general fund. And on top of that, it's also uh, completely repaid um, the negative cash balance that it was at, and it's actually positive now. Uh, the water fund continues to uh, do quite nicely and um, exceeds the recommended reserve, which is about 490000 um, the water fund, the balance that we have for that, we're going to be able to actually pay internally now for any of the water projects we are doing. Uh, the wastewater fund, you can see there was a slight reduction compared to last year. Um, that reduction is because now we're starting to pay for the last uh, remaining portions of our wastewater treatment plant that was part of the uh, financing plan from the very beginning. And so uh, you will see the wastewater fund will be even lower at the end of the year. Um, and then we do anticipate each year there will be a continued reduction um, until finally probably somewhere around 2024, 2025, we'll probably be at an equilibrium <coughs> for our uh, wastewater fund. Sanitary fund, uh, we're essentially even with where we were last year. Uh, we have about enough in our reserves now to 
um, a little more than is needed to uh, purchase a new sanitation truck for next year. Um, ambulance fund is essentially even um, with what it's been in the last couple of years. Now that we are starting to uh, get some of our receivables in, hopefully we're going to see some improvement in there um, by the end of the next quarter. Then the last number we have, or the last chart we have, is for the end of the third quarter revenue and expenses. Uh, still uh, similar. You can see the general fund revenue is still incredibly high and higher than what we've had in previous years. The expenses are quite a bit higher. Um, again, the main driver for the general fund expenses being higher, number one was the settlement with SMRI, and then number two were the two new ambulances. Uh, water fund, the revenue is not uh, quite as high as what the total revenue was last year. Um, the reason for that, even though we did sell more water this year than what we had last year, uh, the reason for that was the reduction in water rates that we had uh, that the council approved, I believe it was in January. Um, the uh, wastewater fund revenue, um, we can see in there um, that it continues to do well. Um, the expenses in the wastewater you can see have increased dramatically. That again has actually been because of the capital improvements. So just for everyone to understand, that's really been the wastewater treatment plan. Um, by next year, it's going to be more uh, normalized what the expenses are going to be. The sanitation revenue um, has increased a bit. Um, and that was again due to the change that we had in uh, our utility rates in January. Um, and ambulance revenue has actually picked up quite a lot, uh, which has been very helpful. Are there any questions? Um, then going beyond that, I would, um, for the payroll changes, oh, I'm sorry. You're jumping ahead. Yep. Are there any questions? <laughs> any questions on third quarter financials? Appreciate the charts and the presentation and... It's, uh, we've seen these for a lot of years, and it's good to have good news versus what we have had in the past. So next item is announcements and praise. I'm going to take a moment to pray if you want to join me. Heavenly Father, Sovereign Lord, uh, we appreciate the ability to meet as a group of people. We appreciate our ability to submit our plans to you and to meet with you in prayer. We pray for rebuilding and redeemers for those who need it. Um, we pray for your guidance in this meeting tonight. And just thank you for all, all of our blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First item is included in the packet is a proclamation for the extra mile day. This is something we've done for a lot of years, and I'll read this here. Whereas Sturgis, South Dakota is a community which acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. Whereas Sturgis, South Dakota is a community which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. Whereas Sturgis, South Dakota is a community which chooses to shine a light on and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. Whereas Sturgis, South Dakota acknowledges the mission of Extra Mile America to create 550 Extra Mile cities in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2021. Now, therefore, I, Mark Carstensen, the mayor of the city of Sturgis, do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2021 as Extra Mile Day. So appreciate that. And I think last meeting shows the commitment to this community and what's been given back to worthwhile causes and things that make our town better. So. Other proc or announcements and praise is Hometown Market opens on November 5th until Memorial Day. I believe it's Friday through Sunday till about 4 or 5 was the time. And then once we get into the warmer season, it goes longer. Um, but that's starting this weekend, starting on Friday. On Saturday is Qantas Food Drive. Um, different from years past, they do request that you deliver to them. So uh, no November 6th on Saturday, please take a... Any donations down to the food pantry from 9 to noon. Also, something that is coming up later this week, there is a special meeting that the City of Sturgis is going to host. It has to do with a settlement with the, or an agreement with First Interstate Bank on the discussion and consideration to purchase some intellectual property. Um, that meeting is going to be posted tomorrow morning. 
It'll be at 8 a.m. on Wednesday morning in this chamber. It will be broadcasted live on Facebook, but coming it, relatively quick moving, so I just wanted to make sure that we can get out in the public as much as possible. But on Wednesday morning at 8 a.m., a special meeting will be held. Any other announcements and praise that we miss? Go ahead, Becca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would, this is, falls under praise, and I want to just say thank you, <coughs> excuse me, to the Public Works Department, to Rick Bush and the city staff for all of their hard work the last three weeks in branch cleanup from the October storm. It really um, has been phenomenal in just how you all have. Um, worked to clean up the city to assist our residents and I think it needs to be mentioned that Sturgis was really the only community to go around um, our town uh, to pick up the storm debris so thank you so much Rick and your staff 738 loads at branches well our town looked pretty rough and it's back to looking nice again for sure and also to mention that the week before we did citywide cleanups. So Public Works has been working quite hard in helping keep our community clean. So Deb, what do you have there? I didn't want you to um, get in trouble. <laughs> I didn't want you to get in trouble with Rich Deaver. Actually, the I was corrected on this too. The time that the um, food bank is going to be open. Okay is uh noon to three noon to three instead yeah. of nine to noon the, yeah or nine to three nine to three yeah so available for drop off for donations from nine to three at the food pantry on saturday and then there's five other locations yep. but they're going to be open later at the food pantry thanks for that clarity deb anything else now back to you mr ainsley for a very brief city manager's report tonight mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, and sorry about that. Um, first of all, just one payroll change to announce. We have hired uh, Rochelle Brook in our uh, rallying events department. She will take over as our rallying events coordinator. And then also, I uh, just wanted to remind people that if they still have branches, we do have the Rebel site open that if you're a city resident, uh, you can bring your water bill and you can drop off the uh, branches for free at the Rebel site. Uh, so I know a lot of people weren't able to uh, complete all their trees, but they can still uh, do that for free. They can just go to the uh, rubble site and drop those off there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Item 8 is consent calendar. We just have A through C tonight. Minutes, a plat, and then to approve the open container. So does council wish to remove A, B, or C from the consent calendar and discuss individually? How about anybody in the public wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? We've got a first by Mike to approve consent. Second. We've got a second by Becca. We do have minutes, so we'll go ahead and roll call. I'll start with myself. I'm yes. Becca? Yes. Dean? Jason? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Angela? Yes. Mike? Yes. And Aaron? Yes. Consent calendar is unanimously approved. Item nine is claims. Questions, comments, concerns on claims from council. Public discussion on any claims. <clears throat> Is there a motion? Motion to approve the claims. Well, we have a first, but we have a question by Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I have, I have several questions. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, I'm looking for a page number so Daniel can follow. It's a uh, economic development business improvement district. Page four. That, I don't yep. Have page yep. Anyway, they're paying a lot of funds for lodging the band. Is that customary? Yes. Um, the majority of the bands um, that we're able to get, they're going from one location to another. Um, so they end up staying here overnight, and that's part of their contract. Um, again, if it was on other nights, it would be more expensive than what they are on Wednesday night. And if we didn't pay their lodging, we'd just be paying them more. 
for their actual contract. It's pretty steep when you look at the total. Then on page on page five again, we have the sponsorship Rocky Larry Community Foundation. Uh, what is that sponsorship? For sixty two thousand. That was the um, uh, part of the uh, checks that you sent out or uh, awarded two weeks ago from the rally. So that was uh, money that's going towards the um, endowment, the rally endowment uh, for future years that the uh, the um, interest off that endowment is able to be used for rally charities in future years or other needs. But that's the entity that. Yeah, correct. Yep. Yep. Uh, and the city does have other endowments through the same entity as well. The library has several um, that are run through the Black Hills Area Community Foundation. On page eight, bottom of the page, we're renting tractors now. It's uh, under parks. $5,300. How, how long do we have them for rent? We just did in the spring. We put them in in the fall activity. Uh, John Deere tractor mower. It pulls the 15 foot that way. But we do all the egg brakes and the road brakes. Yes. Uh, so it's it, it's it's averaging us so let's say 5,500 a year. Yeah, it's not worth buying one. I guess that's all I have. We have a first on the floor by Dean, I believe. Is there any other discussion on the claims? We got a second by Becca. Any last discussion on claims? All those in favor, of the, well, we'll go ahead and roll call. Mike, we'll start with you. Yes. Angela? Yes. Kevin? Yes. I'm um, yes. Becca? Yes. Dean? Yes. Jason? Yes. And Aaron? Yes. Bills are paid. Item 10 is public hearings, only one subset tonight. It's use on review uh, for a dwelling in a highway service zone. Mr. Smith is coming forward for a staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The item before you is a use and review application uh, from William Lippold uh, with Mako Enterprises. A little background information for you. Um, he submitted a conditional use on review to allow for a double-wide manufactured home to be moved into 12976 South Dakota Highway 34, Lot C of Glencoe Subdivision. The property is located within a highway service zone. The purpose of the request is to provide a dwelling for management to stay on site for the business located at 12976 Highway 34 and 12998 Highway 34, the Thunderdome and Kickstart. For Title 180512C of the City Ordinance, dwellings and or congregate residences are uses that are permitted under a review within a highway service zone. 1805.12 Highway Service defines a dwelling as any building or portion thereof that contains living facilities, including provisions for sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation, as required by the Building Code. A single dwelling unit shall not be occupied by more than one family or 10 unrelated persons. The applicant intends to move into the home to serve as a dwelling for the management to stay on site to help manage the family business. Similar use and reviews are referenced in the city ordinance, including within Title 1805.13, General Industrial, in which a residential conditional use secondary to the primary permitted use is allowed on review. The existing residential structure on the property was pre-existing prior to annexation into the city limits and has been converted into offices for the business management. The dwelling will be moved in near the existing structure shown in the attached to illustrations and the landowners within 200 feet were notified per ordinance. A sign was placed on the property for 21 days. Considering the information provided and definitions provided by the city ordinance, Staff does not foresee any issues with this request. Uh, budget impact and additional structure on property will increase total assessed value. 
The Planning Commission did vote to recommend approval of the request on the October 5th meeting. Staff recommends the City Council approve the request with an annual review. And Mr. Lippold is here if you have any questions. Him and his family are here. Any questions for Dave from Council at this point? So procedurally, Dave, use on review, considered, approved each following year, planning and zoning would look at it. If there was any situation where it became a difficult situation or a problem, that's when it'd come back for council. Yeah, as our ordinance currently reads, and I don't believe there's any changes to that, uh, the use on review will be, if there's no complaints made to my office uh, where this needs to be looked at, the use on review will just go uh, to planning and zoning, and they'll just approve it. It won't even come back to you unless they request that it comes back because of any issues that might have for, uh, be unforeseen. How about public discussion, questions, comments, concerns on considering this use on review? Not that it matters, but will there be anyone staying there year round? William Lippold, I'm the uh, current manager of uh, Kickstart Travel Center in the Thunderdome, the Sturgis Dragway. We will be living on site year round. Um, we look forward to being a part of the community up here and continuing the positive relations that uh, our business has in the community. Thank you and welcome to Sturgis. Thank you. Any other discussion? Public or council? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We've got a first by Mike and a second by Kevin to approve the use on review. Any last discussion? <coughs> All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. 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 No. That motion carries unanimously. And thanks, Dave. Welcome for sure, Mr. Lippold. Thank you very much. Item 11 is reports, subset A is the first reading of ordinance 2021, title 18. Um, this is something that we discussed previously just as discussion and we'll make this the Eric Miller show here for a little bit. So we'll turn it over to you on this first consideration, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> title 18, the primary changes are with Article 7, Sections 2, 5, and 6, and these primarily address uses on review, variances, and then amendments to the zoning ordinance. The prior process was for a use on review would generally require that uh, the applicant or through the city get consent or voting from all the local surrounding landowners. and. The, after reviewing, this process isn't necessary for uses on review. Ultimately, it has no effect on the actual zoning ordinance itself. So then the written consent requirements as provided under Section 6 wouldn't apply to uses on review. So one revision is to remove any potential language that would require a voting or consent requirement for uses on review. And then in, as part of the revisions, notice to surrounding landowners for the use on review is paramount. So adding language for the signage that would be placed on site of the use of review to try to provide as much notice to the local landowners to voice any concerns at the planning commission meetings or at the council meetings. Um, and then section five is revised to include more of that signage requirements. The primary revisions are with section six, the amendments to a zoning ordinance. And that would normally apply to something like a rezone of a district where it would actually change the language or change the zoning ordinance. And the primary change with that, the current process is you would have to get written consent or a voting 
through send notice to all the surrounding landowners up to 250 feet or at the current ordinance says 150 feet but the revisions would change that to 250 but it would the prior process involved using assessed value of the land and then a weighted voting require to the property owners the statutes that that's based off of actually are based off of aggregate or aggregate land area rather than assessed value so the revisions change it to reflect the statute and the process would work is if uh, say an applicant wanted to rezone a district they would have the aggregate area consists of the area that would be affected by that rezone plus any property owners within 250 feet of that rezone and the it would the written consent requirements would consist of obtaining 60 percent of that aggregate area written consent from those property owners so for example if the aggregate area is 10,000 square feet they would have to obtain written consent from landowners which would consist of about 6,000 square feet and that could be through a variety of different methods say like one landowner owns 6,000 square feet that would satisfy the written consent or if it was a hundred landowners with 60 square feet that would also satisfy it so there's multiple ways of it's just primarily aimed towards the square footage <laughs> so then that would also include any unassessed value such as churches or public land things of that sort so it kind of creates more of an even field and it's more in line with the, the statutes uh, and then an additional revision to that is if the it's unable to like if an applicant is unable to meet that 60 percent threshold there is the possibility of an appeal process to where if it would go to run through the standard appeal process where it would go to the city manager and then if the applicant is unsatisfied with the city manager's decision then it would go to the city council to, and they would require a two-thirds vote to overcome that prior denial so it creates a basis for the city to potentially create some checks and balances rather than having if a group of landowners say didn't particularly like that applicant and they're making just refusing consent based solely off of that then it provides a means of checks and balances but generally the thresholds higher with the two-thirds to overcome that so it's tries to balance the process and there still would that would just basically move on to <clears throat> the continuing the process so any non-consenting landowners could voice their any objections at the planning commission meetings or at the city council meeting when determining whether or not to approve the rezone and that's let me back you up a little bit eric and make sure that i understand this right but on the use for review process the current ordinance the way we're making modifications or proposing modifications to when you go out for a use on review there's there's a vote that occurs and in the new language there's no longer a vote there's an opportunity for people to submit comments and part of that was driven because if there was no comments received or no vote received it was assumed to be an affirmative and we the city over the years has discussed that and decided you know that's not really a fair way to represent the neighbors voices so the actual voting percentages were removed yet the opportunity for comments is what's the driving force on does this make sense for the council to a consider this or be rejected so is that a fair statement that's correct that in addition sense? to that it's proposed that notices would be sent to the property owners as well as residents that was an issue that previously or under the current language notices are sent to the property owners and then they are able to vote this way the Planning Commission and then the City Council are able to hear from both property owners as well as the actual residents because 
you would often hear concerns from a uh, resident who happens to be renting a home that they didn't get to necessarily voice their concerns, even though maybe they've lived in that house for 10 years or more. Uh, question. When it's up for review, is it the same process? I mean, this is an annual requirement now. <clears throat> so if the, if the first one's approved and it comes back around next year for the Lippold family, I don't think there's anybody within 250 feet, to tell you the truth, other than the school and some cows. But let's say it was in town. If it comes back up, when it comes up for use on review, are the people in the uh, immediate area going to receive another notice? No, there's not going to be a notice sent to everyone. Um, instead, during that year's time, if people have issues, they're able to contact planning, planning and permitting. And then if there are issues that come from that, then it goes to the planning commission. The planning commission debates whether or not it should be renewed. Um, if they vote that it should be uh, denied, then at that point they can appeal that denial back to the city council. Um, but there's not going to be notices sent out again. The number of use on reviews that we currently have, I don't even know what the number would be. It's, it's 50, 60. I mean, it, it would become really challenging to be sending out notices within 200 feet every year. But if there are problems, it is documented. And, and, and it's in the SIP as well. It, uh, it used to be, I like the policy, policy that we had 25, 30 years ago, where it was up on the property owner to either go around and personally obtain a signature or a certified letter to each resident and property owner. Uh, if they want a use on review, I guess I have no problem sending people out and about to, to, you know, to meet the neighbors type thing. They still like that, that method where you got to get face to face with people. And if the council would like, that could definitely be changed to authorize that. The reason that was changed several years ago, though, was there were several instances where applicants would color somewhat their project uh, to neighbors to get the neighbors to end up signing um, off on it. And so that's when the council at that time said, no, it should be the city staff that's a disinterested party um, to write the notice to explain what the application is to the residents so that it's not the applicant actually trying to push to get um, to get a signature. And I think that's the spirit of the sign and that, that you know, notification is to create an atmosphere in the neighborhood for a significant amount of time that when they drive by, they say, well, I should go talk to them, visit with them about what they're talking about. But I agree that the city should always intervene. Sometimes the, it's a lot easier when the, when the neighborhood's on the same page as far as what's going on there. And, and I think that the spirit of that is achieved within this proposed language for sure. So I have a, I have a question, please. So procedurally, that will stay the same, <clears throat> excuse me, on the zoning changes. Um, the city will be the one to notify the residents within the 250 foot area. And it's not upon the applicant to go sure. get the votes, right? Is that correct? Yeah, that correct? process will stay the same. Okay. All right. And then um, I have another question also, and it's just, um, why within the use on review and variances, is it a 200 foot area and for zoning it's 250? What dictates the difference there? Um, I mean, I, the zoning or the use on review, the prior statute or ordinances had 200 feet. There was one instance where I think there was just a mix up where it said 300 rather than 200, but it, any changes were just to make everything uniform and that is generally just I mean there's really no statutory basis for that it's just more expanding the amount of time for the notice the 250 feet with the zoning amendment is actually in the statute that's why it was changed from 150 to 250 
So it's more to reflect the changes. State codified law is where yes. that comes yeah. from. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Miller. I appreciate your work on this. Other discussions on first reading of Title 18 changes, use on review, zoning, public and council discussion. Title 18 is a big chapter, and it's a you eat an elephant at one bite at a time, I guess. And we've we've done a lot over the years, but Daniel, you look like you're going to add something. <laughs> See if there's anything on the. So procedurally, if this consideration is passed, there'd be a second reading, and then after that second reading is approved. It would be posted in the public paper and law 20 days after that posting. Any other discussion on first reading of Title 18 changes? I do have a question. Go ahead. I want to make sure that uh, we get this on the record. Use on review is 200 feet for zoning changes. Now, it's just for zoning changes is 250. There is a difference in... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not, we don't have, on the use on review, I'll hold that for a second reading. I'll, I'll, I want to get with Eric on this in the meantime. Yep. Any other discussion or is there a motion? So moved. We have a first by Kevin. We have a second by Becca to approve what is presented to the council as considered. Any last discussion? This is an ordinance, so a roll call. Aaron, we'll start with you over there in Italy or wherever you're at. Uh, South, Korea. Yeah. South Korea. Yes, we got a yes for South Korea. Yes. Jason. Dean. Yes. Becca. Yes. I'm um, yes. Kevin. Yes. Angela. Yes. And Mike. Yes. First reading passes the Title 18. Subset B is also a first reading uh, to Title 18. This is for sanitation and uh, Chapter 11, actually, too, with the uh, camping. So, Mr. Miller, we'll turn it back over to you, sir. The primary one issue that we had that was brought up with the prior residential camping was that the number of people being able to camp um, with the primary changes moved that from 15 to tw or not number of people but number of days moved it from 15 to 21 days within a 365 day period um, the other recommend change recommended changes would be one of them is to move potentially move shift the ordinance to title 11 under health and sanitation because um, it appears that majority of the ordinance is geared towards health and sanitation matters such as rubbish and sewer and things of that matter um, the <coughs> additional changes were the adding the non-conforming use I don't believe that changed from the discussion period, but that pretty much outlines what is considered a uh, non-conforming use. The, um, there was additional language added underneath the water, electrical, and wastewater sections that based off of the current status of the ordinance, it generally disallows the any permanent structure that would provide those water or electrical so that would generally apply to rv hookups on the at residences and the additional language clarifies that it, that does the restrictions apply to the rv hookups one matter for the council to consider would be whether or not they a complete restriction of RV hookups is what was intended and whether or not the ordinance would 
want to be changed to reflect one RV hookup or whatever the council deems appropriate. Um, another addition was the adding any residential campsite that has over five campers on site would, would require a porta potty and additional trash receptacle to be placed on this at the residence. Um, let's let's clar clarify that, Eric. When you say campers, you're not talking pole campers. You're talking about individual persons. Because right now the total appears to be 19 campers is the maximum capacity. Individuals. Individuals. Mm -hmm. And once the five threshold is hit, or above five, so it'd be six, would require that an additional trash receptacle and a porta potty be placed on site. I think that's that's just common sense. Do we, do we have instances where that is happening now? I mean, not happening? Oh, absolutely. Yep. And I think to back up nine years or so when this was first considered by that council, I think there was some misunderstanding that the council is making camping illegal. At that point in time, what we actually did is took camping at the residence from being illegal to make it legal. We put some standards on that situation where it had to be owner occupied, the people's house that lived there, it had to have a structure on the property, it can just be an open field. I, I think that it's important to try to make it clear that the city council's intent then and the city council's intent now is to encourage people if they so, so choose to have camping just within the restrictions that are given by both state law and what we wanna keep as, as far as our neighborhoods clean and safe and also the fact that we don't want lots and Sturgis to become occupied just during the rally or buildings removed and become campsites within the city limits of Sturgis was the intent there. So I, I just think for clarity that over the years, people have thought that we're trying to make it harder for people to camp. I think we're trying to one, make it legal on our books and two, make it a safer and cleaner environment for all that come and visit during the rally. And part of that is to ensure that our city limits are have houses within them versus starting to remove houses and add campsites. So, Eric, I apologize for jumping in there. No problem. And one additional revision was we included a permitting system that would allow re relaxation of the, or relief from the restrictions. So if a resident wants camp, like say a family comes in and they wanna, they need a, they're going to be camping in their residence, then they could apply to the city for to relax the 21 days or go beyond that. So it provides options. Any council questions for staff or discussion on said dis well, changes? I, Go ahead, I have a couple comments, I guess. In regard, the first is in regards to the porta potty and additional trash receptacle requirement. I think five is actually a really low number. Um, I mean, I could see if you're pushing upwards of a dozen people or 15 people. Um, but man, I've had more than five kids for a sleepover. So I just feel like that's a really low number and it's perhaps an undue burden on residents. Um, I mean, I guess I feel as if five people camping either in your yard or in an RV, an RV is going to have its own um, toilet and everything. So I just believe again, that that's kind of a low number for a requirement on that. And the second thing is, um, again, with the, not again, the second comment I'd like to make is the application for a permit. Um, so it, it would be if you're wanting campers for more than the 21 days, is that correct? Yes. Okay, all right. And it could apply to different <coughs> restrictions. Too. Sure, okay. 
I think we're being fairly lenient. Let's let's talk about the uh, the buy property and come to town type. How 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 is planning and zoning office going to police that? How it works right now, number one, is whenever anyone uh, contacts us to see if that's possible, um, we inform them that, no, you cannot do that. So that's kind of the first level of enforcement. Uh, beyond that, there's going to be uh, fines and penalties that would be um, levied on individuals who are in violation of that. So again, it's not if you live in your home and if you have uh, some RVs there and some campers. Instead, we're talking about people that have vacant lots and they have tents that show up for two weeks out of the year. Um, in addition to that, we can um, do a more proactive measure, which is places or parcels that have a history of having this, which um, the city staff has a, a good knowledge of that. Uh, after working here for years, I think we know a lot of different areas that have those, uh, we would be able to uh, contact the property owners, letting them know that, you know, if they plan on doing that this year, that would be a violation of the ordinance. And if uh, they do do that, then we would be able to uh, file action against them so that they would not be able to. But again, just to make that clear, that's not for people who live and reside in their homes and invite some guests over. And that's also not if it's the same property owner that's been doing it for years. But what we are talking about is when people are trying to buy lots or trying to buy a home, never live in it and just have a bunch of people uh, come over for a week or two. That was specifically what the council 10 years ago was trying to rectify. And I believe this council still wants to see improvements in that uh, to help resolve some of our housing issues. It was a big problem then, and it still is. So, uh, I'm in favor. I think there needs to be other discussion from council, or at least I just want to reiterate what Eric said, that the current language states zero RV hookups or pedestals outside of the, the structure itself. There has been discussion at both council meetings and a committee where they felt that there was the opportunity to have one was seemed acceptable to council. But I just wanted to make sure people were aware that the way the current language is written is no pedestals of RV hookups currently at residence is the way it's written. If I can ask, as long as you're in it that deep, what about, what about families that bring their RV and live in them for an extended period of time. Because one aspect that you can have based off of the current ordinance is it, if it's run to the residence itself, said, and which would likely include a garage, would be part of the residence. If the hookup is to the residence, then it, that permanent structure wouldn't, or restriction wouldn't apply. That generally only applies to if it's away from the residence. So if there is a means of hooking it up to the residence, that would be allowable underneath the current ordinance. Now let's clarify. Are we talking solely electrical hooks or are we talking wastewater Everything. as well? Yeah, the restrictions include uh, dr drinking water or generally clean water, uh, wastewater, and electrical. Roger, thank you. Any further discussion, public or council, on proposed changes? Come on up, Palmer. My name's Palmer Dahl. I just had a couple questions. One, I've got a property that's already got hookups setting out away from the building. Are those grandfathered in or are those okay? Um, yeah, if it falls underneath the non-conforming use, then it would be acceptable underneath the ordinance. Okay, if, if it's on a residential or a rental property, is it the same? Okay. Yes. 
Okay. Is there a house or a permanent yes, there's, residence? Yes, there's permanent residence there, but I just was curious when they said that. I, I was confused as to whether those existing ones would be okay or whatever. But since there is a house and there is a residence there, then it's okay. Yes. Pre-existing non-conforming use is the language. Yep. I'm a little slow, thanks. No, no, it's all good. And, and I think the other spirit of this is to include is that there's consistency in these uses. It's not every five years when there's a lot of people in town. It's You can use it every year or you don't get to use it at all is the intent. This for clarity. I agree. Any other discussion on proposed changes to camping, which include title change? Well, again, um, going back to the more than five people for the porta potty or the trash receptacle, how difficult is it going to be for um, the um, inspection personnel to go to a home? And I mean, how does that process work? Okay. And there's one 300 for three residents is what it figures out to be. And usually it's one or the other two residents or both of them fall into the AR Polk Bowl. And it was just emptied yesterday. And we're going to look at it and there's people camping there. Uh, and I get what you're saying, but five guys coming to the rally to party produce a lot more garbage than five kids. <laughs> Yeah. Sure, yes. No, I understand that. You haven't heard about Becca's sleepovers, have you? <laughs> <laughs> There's no comment on that. So. Okay. So when we talk additional trash pickups and size, what are the prices then for the different receptacles? Is that is that what we're looking at would be something similar? Well, there's there's two different ways you could do it. One is you do the special sanitation fee. That way you're not um, having to necessarily look and monitor at this resident how many times we were picking up garbage to it. Okay. That would truly be the easiest. That, I think, right now is 190 Yeah, I think it's about... It's close to about 190, okay. and that's for the the weeks around the rally. Um, or you could do um, something that would end up saying for every additional pickup, there's the extra charge that we usually do each year, or I'm sorry, that we, we do year-round. The problem is, honestly, administratively, that would become very challenging at a time that our, our sanitation personnel are already working – I don't know, 20, 30 days in a row and working 12 hour shifts and longer, it would be a lot easier to just point out, yeah, that, that residence has a whole lot of tents. They can pay the special sanitation fee. Okay. That would be our preference. Which we probably need some clarity on before this consideration. It, we can note in there that it would be at the special, the special sanitation fee. And that's okay. not a significant change. Sure. So the intent behind the the five person regulation I mean are we assuming then that the resident is charging these people what if they're not what if they're just friends and we're going to say sorry you still fall under this regulation that's why I kind of think maybe it should be a little higher and I, if you I don't know. if you do want it higher than 5 I mean that's you know, your guys' prerogative, whatever the majority of you want is fine, and that's what we'll have. But I think irregardless if you charge them or not, they're still producing the trash, and they're still producing that impact on their neighbors and also on everyone else. And so even if there's no charge or if there is a charge, there should still be a contribution to pick up those extra costs so that the rest of the community isn't paying for that. It's absolutely amazing. But I live in a commercial district, downtown Sturgis, during the rally. And from my garage, I have the opportunity to watch 
three 300 gallon totes. And you would be surprised the people that come in with their pickups from other locations and will fill a 300 gallon tote with a pickup every day is coming into town more in my neighborhood anyway, is coming is coming from rural areas and outside of town more than it is in the residents. Uh, I have pictures, yes. Well, during that time of the year, it gets a little dicey, especially for the, the police. If the garbage can is tipped over or tipping over and, or running over, I usually take a picture of the vehicle. <coughs> and uh, I've never had to turn anybody in, but boy, as soon as I roll out there in a golf cart and start snapping pictures, it... Uh, it changes pretty quick. We also have the consideration the way it's currently written of the no hookups. So if we can discuss that a little That's bit. That's one thing, yes, I was wanting this. So did there'd be no hookups, water, sewer, um, electrical at a residence? If it's attached to the residence, so I guess it's, it's, so. Is it like physically on the house, or say you have a separate camping pad for your camper that you pull it off down to? Just long as everything's ran through, it's the power's ran through the house. I mean, so it's metered properly. It's not a separate meter or something like that. Is what you're saying? Or um, I mean, it, generally the the current statute says it has to be attached to the residence. Okay. Whether, I mean, that potentially might have some gray area on actual interpretation okay. on what consists of being attached to the residence, whether it's a, a post that's right next, like almost touching the residence, or if it has to actually be attached. I just look at some of the lots and search if they got a bigger lot or something like that, and they pull their camper down off because they got a flat spot or something and want to have a hookup there. Um, I mean, that'd be great to have that. I mean, it'd be something I would like to have, you know, someday down the road. But uh, I think you're taking away from even just residents that want to go camping that want to store their camper at their place there for the being able to, I mean, hook up and get things ready for the weekend, I guess. So the so. way the current ordinance is written, uh, you couldn't. It would it's restricted to have, say, like another pad on the property and then have a, a standalone hookup. Um, I mean, but that's something that if the council deems is in interest to change, we can change the language and update to include a hookup or whatever the council deems appropriate. I, I think it's fairly common to find the electrical hookups. What's uncommon is to find Next to the electrical hookup, somebody's put in the sewer dump. If, if it's going to be a annual thing and around the around the, the summer, whatever, if it's going to be more than one or two days, that physical sewer dump is going to be an issue. Uh, that's pretty spendy for the for all the homeowners to put in a physical. <clears throat> they You can't have a separate service line just for the an RV dump. Uh, oh, but <clears throat> that would be, I can see where in most cases it would be tapping into the residential sewer. It's got to be hooked into through, through a residential, it, it can't be its own separate line. I understand. I'm just, just trying to make the point to the council that there's very few people going to cut a hole in their house and run the sewer pipe from the camper to inside the basement of the home. And it's not required, Mike. What what the discussion is is if 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 currently the way it's written, you can't do that. But Jason said maybe you know it makes sense to be give someone that capability at least to a certain degree.
But as far as a pedestal and Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, isn't this more geared toward, say, the the places that have more than one? This isn't geared toward someone, say, like Jason or myself that just has the one camp for their residence. This is more Correct. bigger scope. Yeah, and and this again is meant to address when there's individuals that start taking out building permits and they're starting to build their new house or do new landscaping or something like that. And they have grand plans about creating a, a miniature um, Sturgis RV park in their backyard to be able to explain. It's wonderful to, you know, during the rally to have a few guests over and it's also fine to have a place where some in-laws or something can stay for a while in the summer, but no, this is not, you know, your backyard shouldn't become a major RV park. That's what this is kind of designed towards. So if Dean had more than five people camping, would he have to get a porta potty then? Or a new another garbage can? Yeah, according to this, they would. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it's proposed. Yeah. Correct, so Unless you change the number. Yeah. I mean, could we you can change kick it up to eight people? Is that five people or five camping units? Five people. Five people. Five people. Yeah. So if and when we get to a motion, I think it sh would it, uh, behoove us to include the number of people that is the trigger for the special sanitation fee. And if not, if it's allowable to to build one RV hookup separate from the housing structure itself. And anything else anybody would like to add? Well, what was the max number of campers? 19. 19, okay. I was just trying to figure out like a third or something like that, a, a rough number to be fair. Or just under half or? How about any further discussion? Go ahead, Mike. I move to approve based on the present discussion. With the ability to have one hookup separate from the house? Yes. For that discussion? There's going to be some conflict with state, and, and that's going to require a whole other account for a water meter, and it's got to run in conjunction with the house. I, I think there's some confusion about whether it needs to be directly attached to the house or just part of the the home's infrastructure. Right. I mean, yeah, it, it, it needs to go to the service line. You don't want to have a separate service line from the backyard somewhere to the sewer main. That That's what this eliminates. It doesn't mean that you actually have to attach the RV line in your backyard into your basement somehow. I, we're not talking about that. But we're saying it goes to your service line. Right. So how about the number, Mike? Are you okay with the five? Is that what your I'm good motion? With, I'm good with the number. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna go be gonna go count anybody, but if you got a neighbor that's uh touchy, it could be an issue. So your motion would include approval of the first reading with no additional language to the RV hookup and with the current number of five triggering the special sanitation. Is yes. that fair? So we got a first by Mike. That's a second. Motion dies with lack of a second. Is there a Additional motion, some different structure. Well, I'd like to still discuss, you know, the number that triggers the porta potty and garbage can requirement.
have the tools to be able to address it. it it's not, I mean, in, in every situation is going to be a little different. Being a family of, of eight that's got four kids is different than five grown individuals, and I think that's a difference. I think the staff can articulate that and look at it and present it that way. I, I still think that we need to just have a little bit higher number because I think five is just really, it's low. In some cases it's not. I, I mean, I deal with it every year, so I'm telling you it's not. And I'd be happy to meet you this year during the rally. I'll come with you. Okay. <laughs> I, I will go. Yep, I will go see that. <laughs> Count me in. All right, go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yep. No, I understand the, the number five, and maybe during the rally, five is the number, but outside the rally, the rest of the year, I, I agree with Beck on that. I'm just not sure if, uh, you know, that number seems pretty low for the things that people are going to want to do for recreation, family, and whatnot within their own residents. And I'm sure we have residents that do already do this exact same thing. Um, again, it's just about putting that burden upon our residents and the breach of, of government into their property. So I would like to see it at eight. I think that would be a fair compromise. You make the motion. Okay. I move to approve um, the first reading of Ordinance 2021 dash. I do not have that number. I apologize. Okay. Thank you. Um, zoning to Title 11, Health and Sanitation, Camping in Residential Zones, to include the number um, for the requirement of the porta potty and the trash receptacle from five to eight people. I'll second that. We've got a first by Beck and a second by Mike. I'm sorry, eight. Yes, eight. I think that's plenty reasonable. Any last discussion? Did you hear all that, Aaron? Aaron, a question, question on the, uh, I'm trying to look down the, the document here, the number of days. Is it like over one day or two days where this kicks in? Good question. Yeah. Is there a requirement with eight people, if that's the case, to be able to execute getting those couple things? There isn't anything specific in the language, Aaron, that state, um, whether it's 24 hours or anything, but I think the intent is when they come in for the rally, there's going to be activity for at least 10 days. So I, I assume that, you know, pretty much one day or 10 days, it's equal. It's the best way to say it. If there's eight people camping. It, it is, and I think it would be easy to add an inclusion, uh, Councillor Zerps, if you would like to, to state that if uh, eight or more individuals are staying for three or more days or four or more days. Three days. Three days. I, yeah. Just a thought. Could we put a date between July what and August what, and then that is going to be five days and then or five campers and then after that it is eight throughout the rest of the year just a thought so you're saying have leave it at five for the two weeks of the or the days of the Roughly rally route yes when the yeah and then you could have it up to 
eight people the rest of the year. Um. I, th I think also about that. to back up a little bit, back when you're stating that, you know, this is, you feel a little bit of government overreach and intrusion on the residents. I think the intent of this is to protect our residents that live there year round and can't take the trash out because they're usually normal 300 gallon tote is relatively open, but for some reason during the month of August, it's quite full. So I, I think that that's, the balance here and I think that we're kind of getting lost in the weeds here with uh, what our intent is um, for camping. I think that the intent of the ordinance is to specifically regulate the camping during the Sturgis motorcycle rally. I don't think Dave is too worried about the rest of the year other than that if people are living in their campers year round. So I guess I just want to bring some clarity to the situation on let's don't muddy the waters. I don't think that outside of the rally we have too many conflicts, problems, or neighborhood disputes except during the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally and that's the need for the special sanitation. Right, and I agree with you on that, but I think also that it's probably what you just said, but there's a fine balance between protection of the citizen and also burdening the citizen who is having camping on their, you know, on their property. Their, that they live in and what this addresses. And to me, I just think that five is an extremely low number. Well, we have a first on the floor with the number eight and a, and a second with the number eight. If you want to amend something, you have to do it before we vote. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Because I'm, no. Well, if she was not going to amend, I'll make a substitute motion. I'd like to add three days. Substitute motion. Sure, I'm, eight people. Um, that's fine. Three days. I'm friendly to that. So we have a substitute motion of the first motion's suggested language with numbers yet to include the phrase for three days. Three days. Mr. Mayor, if I can just ask for one more bit of clarification just to ensure that it's meant to be, if this substitute motion were to uh, go forward, that it'd be for three days, eight people or more, and it would be the special sanitation fee. During the rally. During the rally. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have a substitute motion on the floor. Is there a second to that? Second. It was second by Jason. Mark Marshall helped me with Robert's rules if I do this wrong. Yeah. We, have, we, have to, we have to vote on the first one, correct, and then do the substitution after. Yeah, and the person making the initial motion may consent to the substitution. Yes. So if the first and the second consent to the substitution, it becomes one motion. Which you, I consent. You consent? Yes. Does the second consent? I do. So through this procedural uh, mud, we have a first and a second on the floor for first reading of residential camping, changing the language to include more than eight campers for more than three days during the motorcycle rally triggers the special sanitation needs. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. 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 Opposed to no. That motion is unanimous, I believe. Is that fair no. to state? No. Okay. I Let's roll no. call. Jason, we'll start with you. Yes. Aaron? Roll call on now. Yes. Dean? No. Becca? Yes. I'm yes. Kevin? Yes. Angela? Yes. And Mike? Yes. First reading passes. So we'll bring that forward to number for the second reading next meeting. So, Eric, if it wasn't getting confusing enough, we're going to go ahead and turn over noise to you on Title 13. But give us your staff report, please. That's good. <clears throat> the, it's, it was based on the discussion at the prior council meeting. It was evident that the st structure of the ordinance was confusing and unclear. So 
we've completely revamped the structure of the ordinance and of many of the different aspects. But one of the primary changes was adding in a table that expressly provided when the restricted times are. So it was, and also we changed the times to reflect what was recommended by the local business owners. Uh, we, the times are Sunday through Thursday, starting at 11 p.m. and goes to 8 a.m. then the following morning. And then Friday and Saturday, and since it starts at midnight, technically that would start Saturday at midnight or 12 a.m. and then run to uh, Saturday at 8 a.m. But for continuity, keeping it as labeling as Friday and Saturday, an option could be to, if you want to more clarification, we could put it at 11.59 p.m. That way it's a little bit more, but it's, uh, I left a note in the ordinance stating, trying to clarify. <coughs> and then also it included <coughs> uh, a construction and during the rally, it's 1 a.m. to 8 a.m. for the restricted times. And that includes the three days prior to the rally. And then also following through with the prior ordinance, there was a construction restriction that started at 10 p.m. and goes till 6 a.m. And that includes uh, power equipment such as lawn mowers and gardening and things of that sort, chainsaws. Um, one of the primary changes um, was uh, that would also include equipment, backup horns, like the skid stairs and stuff like that. So yes. Th yep. Nothing's changed. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, one primary difference from the prior ordinance is that we're, we tried figuring out a a standard that would work to determine whether or not, say, something was going on during the restricted time, whether or not it would be a violation. We place the standard as if a person was standing on the property boundary and they could hear, plainly hear the noise, then it would be in violation. And then there's also a definition on what's plainly audible, which would be more if you could make out the the voices, um, type of music, things of that sort. Um, and general enforcement would be done by Sturgis PD. Um, one difference is we actually put out different types of specific prohibitions just to kind of provide more clarity on horns, loudspeakers, uh, concerts, uh, loading operations, construction work. There's, and then there's a complete ban on dynamic engine braking. That's reflective of the prior ordinance or the current ordinance. And also we wanted to clarify by enumerating specific exceptions to this, to these restrictions, which include the, the ambulance, the fire trucks, sirens, things of that sort. Um, any noise from emergency work, there's school outdoor concerts, there's religious organizations, any outdoor worship services, um, there's rallies or city sponsored events, and a variety of different enumerated <coughs> exceptions. One big change from the prior current ordinance and also the prior discussed ordinance is we added a permitting uh, process where you uh, say like a local business owner wants to relax or have a concert that goes beyond the potential restricted times. They can apply for an application for a permit or for apply for a permit to put on that. And then we can get public comment and uh, the council can decide whether or not to grant that permit. Um, 
And I think the the substance of the prior ordinance is within this. It's just a tries to really clarify and make things fairly simple. And I guess to summarize, during the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, at 1 a.m., the amplified noise is, is prohibited. Throughout the rest of the year, it goes until midnight on Friday and Saturday. And on Monday through Thursday, it's uh, until 11 is the way the, the, the first reading is. I'd like Eric to go back and re-clarify the property line. Did you write anything in there as far as a boundary? You, you, you mentioned if it could be heard from a property line. I wasn't sure whether you're making an example or, <clears throat> or describing a... Um, the actual language that I have so far is, uh, it's a violation if done in such a manner as to plainly, to be plainly audible from the property boundary of the source or plainly audible from 20 feet from say like a parked vehicle or 50 feet from a moving vehicle. So it's the property boundary of the place. I'll say the residence is emitting uh, a noise and it, to determine whether or not it would be in violation would be able to plainly audible from the property boundary of that residence. Or business. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to just discern between that audible noise during the rally or anything like that. But <clears throat> I don't think the chief has got anything in concrete that he can, can nail down there just yet. You know, we, in the past, uh, I was on the council when we had to rewrite these in the very beginning. We had uh, semis setting in Lynn's Dakota Mart par parking lot, ridding their reefers all night on Saturday and Sunday night when the drivers had exceeded their company policy for driving. Those reefers would run 24 hours a day, Friday night, Saturday night. Uh, where do we, how do we rate those type of occurrences into this ordinance as well? That would be within 20 feet of said vehicle is the way it's written. So if you got within, if chief got within 20 feet of that semi truck and could hear that noise clearly, it would have to be prohibited during those times. So you, they would be in violation. And if it's moving, it's 50 feet. Yes. It's pretty restrictive. I, I'm not saying that I disagree with it, but what I'm saying is uh, we don't have a truck park. We don't have a filling station where they can go park. I'm just saying this this is going to occur. I just want the chief to know that it's going to occur and there's going to be residents that complain and he's going to have to enforce it. So is it an enforceable regulation this is my point. <laughs> that's true thank you chief I, I I know we've had past problems um on the construction end of things uh, a little bit on uh, privately owned um, snow removal businesses. Um, say there's an event that, yes, at 10 o'clock that it was done with and they want to get a, you know early start or something to be able to clean out uh, what, I guess, uh, how does that fall, I guess, for like backup beepers, that kind of stuff? Um, I mean, if it's private, I mean, generally it would be restricted, say if it was private snow removal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, that's one th aspect that we could write into one of the exceptions because obviously snow removal occurs, especially if prior to work. Correct. There is an exception for city employees oh. where, like, say, city plows running, that wouldn't fall underneath the ordinance, but private very well could. Okay. Because I do know that, I mean, when the concrete plant was going, there was a resident that was... I mean, you couldn't get concrete very early in the morning because the backup beeper, they couldn't get everything going. And Pete Lee and Sons, I mean, it was something that they had to have uh, part of their, um, I guess, uh, codes or whatever you want to call them, I guess, uh, requirements. But so I guess, yeah, I'm just trying to watch out for, I mean, it's not going to happen all the time. I get that. But uh but be able to clear out parking lots and have the local businesses ready to go in the morning too. If that's something the council would want to change, then you'd probably want to expand the exception to include city as well as private contractors for snow removal. Mm -hmm. Like you just want to ensure that it's for those specific instances. So it's not, you know, roofers that are starting at four in the morning because they're trying to get a lot of work done, you know. The school is exempt from it. Any other discussion? Council or public? Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Council. Mark Brook with Loud American. And uh, I guess one of the questions I have is I didn't get a time to go over this whole thing. Um, one of the questions would be, how do we deal with, uh, are we saying there's no amplified music allowed after, is it 1 a.m. or midnight, uh, even during rally time? Rally is 1 a.m. And that's outside. So this was, so the, we're saying that we can't play any Music. I mean, is it, to me, there's a difference between live music and, or a concert style music and music in general. Because I can tell you, the minute you uh, shut your music off, everybody leaves. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we're open till two o'clock in the morning. So the question would be, um, is there a chance we could change it to live to live music in order to try to protect everybody from the concert volumes, which I think is where the problem lies most generally um uh, just reminds me of the discussion like ken mcnaney was talking last time about you know at, at the end of their concert being able to do a dj for a while or something to keep people from completely dispersing at the end of the um evening so just a thought there For clarity, Eric, is the new the proposed written language is for outdoor amplified is the way the language is. The, the, the way it's written right now, if, say, they, the inside music is loud enough to where you can, you can hear, hear it from the property line, that would be in violation. Clearly audible. Yeah. If I was a bar owner, I wouldn't like that. No. During the rally, it's different, though, so. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Bernie. Come on up, Bernie. Bernie, you, Sarah. Um, have you had discussions with all of you, discussions with the bar owners here in town about this? Have you have been able to sit down with them and work through this noise ordinance when it concerns music, the concerts, et cetera? Um, 
sitting here listening to this, I'm going, have, have our council representatives even spoken to these people about this? And I'm getting these looks at me like, what are you talking about? But my concern is that we've got businesses here in town that during the rally, they make their money to help for the rest of the year in their expenses. And we start putting all of these regulations down. That's, that's hindering them. And is that right? Um, I believe that this rally was here way before we were, and it's been doing just fine, but if you start putting down more regulations, what is it going to do for the future? What is it going to do for these bar owners? The rally is noisy, people. It is noisy. And come on, 10 days out of the, out of the week, out of the year, and maybe a few days before and a few days after, the city makes money off of the rally. Individuals here in the community make money off it, whether it's even camping in their yards. Every, you know, so let's, let's have more discussions with these individuals that these ordinances are really going to affect. So, so Brenda, if I understand, and I'm not, I'm just trying to understand now. So you disagree with the third box down on the far right? There's a special rally exemption. Okay, so goes, at 1 a.m., I go ahead. I was going to say, it just goes to 1 a.m. is the, I know. the way it is. Then let them turn on the jukebox. You know, if, the, if it's inside the loud, if it's inside the knuckle, if it's inside, you know. They, they can, Bernie. They, they can, but then you're saying if the people next door can hear it, then it's a complaint and they get shut down and then their customers walk out the door. I, well, I guess it, we, you can always make the point either way, but I, I thought I thought the way it's written now is more lenient than we've had in the past. I mean, as far as a written ordinance, what, what do you think it should be? I understand the music outside until 1 a.m., okay? I get that. Uh-huh. But if the loud wants to continue with the jukebox or a DJ after that inside, they should be able to do that and not be sanctioned because Jane Doe or Joe Doe put their hearing aids in and can hear the music. Yeah. I don't disagree with you, but I, I think I think we're going a little bit too far here. Uh, I don't know of any organization, Mark, yours included. Uh, I don't think the, the chief has ever shut you down, you know, other than when we <clears throat> allowed Mr. Turkey to leave his speakers on for 18 hours during some event. Uh, I think Mark was instrumental in cutting the wires to the speakers on uh, somebody was uh, uh, on both ends of town. He had the speakers on top of the auditorium and speakers on top of a structure. I think, it, I don't know whether there's a pyramid or what was down there, but they were left on for 18 hours. And finally, somebody took the initiative just to go cut the speaker wires because they couldn't get Turkey out of bed. I I I I agree with the third box down. Uh, okay. I mean, one o'clock. It's time to time to start tuning it down a little bit. Uh, but I don't think that's being overly restrictive. Uh, you know, bars supposed to 
bar is supposed to be empty at 2 a.m. Uh, Mark, maybe you want to talk about how you uh, bring the crowd down. Uh, I used to have to do that. We used to have to calm the calm the crowd before we turn the gates out. Well, for sure. I mean, and that's where I go back to the live music part of it. And I, and I, to, to back up a little bit, I completely sympathize with especially what's going on in your ward and uh, um, the neighbors and certainly uh, being a year-round business in downtown, we certainly don't want to offend any customers in town. Um, but I can tell you this, if we turn off all the amplified music in the pavilion next to the loud during the rally, that building is going to empty out, empty out immediately. Um, and back to what got said a minute ago, um, I'm even concerned with shows that might happen indoors. You know, we've got a lot of, lot of uh, glass on our building downtown, and when you, when you get a fair amount of people in there for shows, even in whatever, May or June, um, if the weather's nice, you like to open the doors. Well, it sounds to me like from this, if somebody can hear anything on the curb, next to the building, we're in violation of this. And I'm not saying, um, obviously, this is up to the discretion of the uh, chief. De chief or department, or, um, but it, it, it feels like we're kind of set up to get be in trouble nearly every weekend we have a show in the summertime. Exactly. I'm, I'm certain that's not the intent, but I'm just, I'm just, it feels like we're in violation. And I guess one more thing about one o'clock during the rally, it seems like we're really coming down on businesses now and we've got thousands of bikes on Main Street that are roaring and making all sorts of racket. I mean, the kind of rumble that I can hear 10 miles out of town in my house, but, but it's the sound system playing in the tent that is the problem. I'm just really concerned that we're doing one more thing to chase people out of town even sooner. And it's been hard enough to keep them in town over the last decade as, as the venues outside of town keep working on them. But again, I want to do everything. I want to be helpful in this too. I want to be a good neighbor to the Plague Myers right up the street from us. Um, I feel like this has really changed a lot since we were all here a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I know that I'm sure the council's put a lot of time and energy into this. I really wish it could be tabled to some degree so we could have a little bit more interaction between the business owners and especially since it looks like I'm the only one here tonight to speak on behalf of the restaurants and, and bars downtown. Just another hat for you to wear. I guess. <laughs> Well, any other discussion? I have a, I have a couple comments, please. Okay. Well, I would like to see a consistency because really we're talking about the time, times of the year. And so outside of the summertime, we don't have outdoor concerts or any kind of live shows that occur on Main Street. Um, so I would like to see us go to having it be midnight from Sunday to Saturday, seven days a week. And then for the rally or beginning in June, we take it to 1 a.m. or even 1.30 um, to just have a – because 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. seems kind of an early – it just seems early to me. Um, but I would make the compromise to have it be midnight – even and then summertime because there are venues in our community that hold shows during the summer outside of the rally so i think that midnight during the summertime is restrictive and i think it should be 1 a.m uh, i hate to bring this up and most of the public won't know about this but there was about 40 people in a room last wednesday identical complaints. At least 
20 homeowners there. Complaining about that they're just trying to take care of now. And it's because, in my opinion, in my alone, not the council, it's because the operator slash owner of that venue didn't want to play by the rules. They, I think I'm saying that terribly tactfully. Anyway, you know, it's hard for the chief to enforce it on one and not the other. I have no problem with that recommendation of midnight. I know it's a difference between 11 and 12 at that point in time. Uh, I, I, could, I could live with that. I could get by with that. But we have to have some type of throttle to keep things in line because, again, we have people that don't necessarily live in the community operating venues uh, that cause the problem. I would also say that, I mean, to not just get carried away, and I appreciate you being here, Mark, and just as you're the only owner here representing that group, the group of people that primarily are concerned with the noise or struggle with it, I mean, they're not represented here right now at all. So we've got to be mindful of those people, just like you're saying, the people that were in the room, but then there's people across the city as well that are that are affected by this. And it's it's not an easy decision. It's not an easy task to uh, to walk the line. Well, and I think, too, you know, you need to look at just the geography of our town. I mean, interstate traffic, that is a noise 24-7. You can sometimes hear the announcements at Woodle Field, and you have a football game going, and you have people who go to bed 8 o'clock at night, and you can you can hear that. I live in the middle of town on Shepherd Street, and, I mean, while we know that there's discussion around a certain venue, it's all venues that produce this noise. And to, to reiterate the comment, the two weeks in August are noisy. And you have noise from bikes, you have noise, for, I mean, it's just what happens. And the fact that we are surrounded by hills, it just, I think, concentrates the, the issue we have. Um, so I, I think that noise is just, it's something that we deal with here, but I don't want to see us, and it's exactly as Councilman Sigmund said, it's the fine balance between resident concerns and business owners and. Um, I guess that puts me on the spot a little bit. Um, I, you know, if you want my opinion, I think that, and I don't know, maybe it got discussed, maybe it didn't get discussed, the, the, or discussed the difference between live music and or concert type music and music in general, because um, I don't feel like if 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 we're going to shut off music outdoors at 1 a.m. on rally at rally time, you're going to hurt. You're going to hurt all the uh, bars, restaurants that do music in general. Anything, anybody with outdoor space is going to be hurt. And you know, I don't know what we do about that. I, to, to me, again, during rally, we've got bikes, thousands of bikes on Main Street. We've got all the, we've got this constant roar going on. I can understand limiting a concert by 1 a.m., but I can't understand shutting off a PA system uh, at 1 a.m. Outside of that, um, you know, it's, it, it's hard, and I think most I think most of us would try to do a good job of trying to manage this, especially understanding the feeling of the community and the council on this, in doing a better job of managing our shows. Um, but when it doesn't get dark till nine thirty at night, you know, on the twentieth of June, 
and you're trying to do outdoor events, you don't get people out till 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. And you can't have a one-hour show or you're going to have, back to what I talked about before, um, your customer experience is what we were all, especially during rally. Um, but even outside of that, your customer experience is what you, you don't want to have bad experiences. And that does make that hard. So if you're asking me, I feel like a midnight time frame is reasonable. Again, there is no problem over the winter because we're not doing anything between whatever, the end of September and the 1st of May. Um, and I don't know if it's a complication to do something with live music separate from amplified music. I, I don't know if that creates another problem, but I think that would help alleviate the problem in some of the neighborhoods is if live music all stopped at 1 a.m., but... If you're telling us we have to turn off our outside music, any amplified music at 1 a.m., it's going to empty out the pavilion at the knuckle. It's going to empty out the pavilion at the loud and anywhere else. And I think, too, else. yeah, and I think, too, a point that I brought up at the prior discussion we had two weeks ago would be a weather delay. You know, if you have a weather delay and your show is postponed for an hour or two, um, I think that the 1 a.m., especially during the rally, could be could be restrictive. So I think 1.30 maybe even would be something to consider. I'm sorry. I don't know how I got. I must have shut it off. There we go. No, I had it off. I'm sorry. You know, let's just be realistic. A venue like the Loud in the summertime, you only have the pavilion for what two to three weeks. Was it two weeks before, a week after. About three weeks. Yeah, about three weeks. And I very seldom get any complaints about the Loud especially since Mark is in town most of the time now. But one and one one o'clock and one thirty at Iron Horse in that neighborhood is not going to fly. Period. Those people are already on pins and needles. Several of them have anxiety just even thinking about the rally coming. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, Angela, you got, a, you got anything you want to say there? Angela heard the same stuff I heard. Uh, it's, I mean, they've reached their limit. Yeah. I mean, Period. Like Dean said, it's, a, it's hard to listen to the business owners. You know, you understand that, you know, you need to keep people in there. Uh, and at the same time, we're hearing from our residents all the time who, who are physically suffering, you know, because of the, the noise. And so this is, I mean, this, this is really hard. Um, I, I don't even like these times the way that they are, you know, but I, I could probably go with it with the 1 a.m. I don't think that during rally... Yeah, I, I just, I don't know how during rally I'd be able to, as far as in our ward, it's really hard to justify saying later than, than one, but I understand it's, it's all of town, too. So, it's tough. <laughs> no matter what we do, there's going to be lead back, uh, upset people. It doesn't matter who, what, when, and where. It's hard, it, you know, and it's really hard for us to come up with a generic time and put it in the law, in an ordinance, so that it can be applied equally and responsibly by the chief and his folks during that time frame. And, you know, it, it comes down to your venue is completely different from the other end of town. But see, I would counter that because I live right five blocks south of here and i hear probably music from loud the ones that are closer to this end of main street yes 
I can show you pictures of windows with pillows and blankets stuffed in them. I mean, I, I under and I understand the plight and the concerns and the frustrations out of your ward, but there is no ward in this town that is not affected. So. Go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> Is there a motion to table in there, Councilor Jordan? Is that what you're saying? I don't think we want to do that. We got a first by Aaron to table. <clears throat> Excuse me, a second by Kevin. All those in favor of the motion to table the discussion on noise ordinance. Roll call it. Go ahead, go ahead, Mike. No, just roll call it. Yeah, go ahead. Yes or no on the I table? I vote no. Angela? Yes. Kevin? Yes. I'm yes. Becca? Yes. Dean? Yes. Jason? Yes. And Aaron? Yes. Motion to table is approved. We'll keep swinging at this one. And Thank have you. meetings with the business people if this affects. Please. Item 12 is other matters before the council. Anything not on the agenda the council would like to discuss tonight? Everybody in the public, other items before the council. None being heard. I do know there's a need to continue executive session. Come on up, Palmer. Well, he's coming up, uh, Mr. Mayor. I did know that um, I unfortunately forgot to bring up one announcement. Okay. Um, the Downtown Foundation Holiday Giveaway um, is beginning this month. And so if you shop at any uh, local downtown merchant, uh, once you get the receipt, I think, and if you write down your name and contact information, they have a box you can put it in, and there's more than $3,000 worth of prizes that will be drawn in early December. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Go ahead, Palmer. Palmer, I just have a couple of items. Uh, I mentioned this quite a few quite a few months ago. If you look at the Sturgis sign up there, you can hardly see it. Now, maybe it's just because I'm old, but we either need to turn the lights on a little more or turn them off completely. I think it's it's showing that we don't have much respect for our town and our sign. We put a lot of money into that sign. Let's be able to see it a little bit. Maybe we can address our signage a little better. Maybe we can make a, a rope signage to go around the letters or something because you cannot see that. And I know a lot of you people don't realize that, but us older people can't. Um, so I'd like you all to look at that sign when you go outside tonight and just and tell me if you think it should be a little bit brighter. Maybe we should shine it from the bottom up or something, or, or like I say, put rope signage around the letters to, to showcase uh, it could be a dull letter, but you know it would showcase the Sturgis a lot better. Uh, which, which one is it, Palmer? Well, the, yeah, the, the Sturgis yeah. sign up on the hill. I know there's two of them. Well, I'm talking about the ones that Sturgis, that Sturgis yeah, put, yeah. put up there and poured the concrete and everything else. The, the public works director has been working on that for quite some time. It's not as Evidently. easy as it seems, but he does have a meeting next week to see if there's a different vendor that could provide some better solutions. But that has been something that they've been working on for quite some time. Okay, I appreciate that input because I, did, I wasn't aware of that and I did suggest that quite a while ago. The other thing is we don't have a, an in-town paper. A lot of the people in town don't, don't realize what's going on with some of these things that are going on with their ordinances right now. I know, you know a lot of people aren't on Facebook if you're like me. Um, so when we, we lost our papers, we lost a lot of local input. Um, we put out little ordinances or little things in the 
our monthly whatever, but it just says ordinance so-and-so. It doesn't really say what we're addressing. And people in town, they read those, and they don't know what they're what it's all about even. So we need to address what it is rather than just the ordinance, what it involves. If it's a noise ordinance or whatever, you know, what kind of what we're what we're going through. So the people in town realize it. We're you know, we're six thousand people here and, and we're fighting with three or four businesses. I'm not fighting with them. I'm, we're just talking talking, you know, noise and everything else. I want our town to grow. I'm I'm one of the best proponents for this town because I love this town. But just my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Palmer. Any other matters? I want a motion for exec. So moved. Okay, first by Dean. Second. Second by Jason. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by stating yes. 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 Opposed to no. Yes. We'll... Uh, it's 8.30. We'll start exec at 8.35. Oh, it's the same. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not just businesses. Yeah, business. That is actually, that. that's already done, that you guys can enforce it. And I saw one of the comments.